Yeah, so hey everyone, I'm Kevin, um, and let's see, is this thing working? <laughs> I'm almost set up. Okay, there we go. Um, yeah, so I work for Khan Academy. For those of you who are not familiar with us, we are a nonprofit, uh, and our mission is to provide a free world-class education for anyone, anywhere. Um, so uh, that's what we do. Uh, we have a bunch of software developers who are helping on that mission, um, in addition to lots of people producing videos and things like that. So, uh, oh yeah, and we are hiring. <laughs> I'll just mention that. Um, I, I work on the web front end team, so we do lots of, lots of JavaScript. Uh, so today, I'm here to talk to you about Aphrodite. Um, I didn't have a hand in creating this, but there were people at Khan Academy who did create this. Um, and basically, Aphrodite lets you put your styles into your JavaScript. So um, does anybody here put your styles in your JavaScript now? Is that like the way you work? Excellent. Anybody using Aphrodite? To do that? No, not yet. All right. Well, we'll see after this talk. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah. So basically, uh, Aphrodite is pretty straightforward to use, but knowing why you'd want to use it, I think, is going to be a big topic for this. So, so I spent some time on that. Um, so the modern form of this idea um, probably started with this talk by Christopher uh, Shadow, who works at Facebook. I'm uh, on, on the React team. He works on DevTools there, and he gave this talk um, actually about two years ago. Uh, almost, and since that time, lots of people have been experimenting with like different ways to do CSS um, styling stuff in general in JavaScript. Uh, lots of experiments. Um, so yeah, Steve Kaufman posted a link to this table. Somebody has produced a, a table of projects doing CSS and JavaScript, and there are a lot of them. Don't try to read that because it's very small. Uh, <laughs> but there are a lot, and um, you know, I happen to think that um, Aphrodite has struck a nice balance as far as the way it works. Um, that you can do a lot without really having any compromises in how you do it. Um, so getting back to uh, Christopher Shadow's talk, basically he um, was talking about the problems that Facebook saw with CSS. With, you know, if you imagine Facebook and like all these different components that are all mingled together on one page um, and the kinds of trouble you'd have. I know these kinds of problems, um, let's see, global namespace, dependencies, dead code elimination, minification, <laughs> sharing constants, uh, non-determinist re uh, resolution, and isolation. These things, you know, we face them in much smaller sites than Facebook. Um, so you can imagine that at Facebook scale, it's just kind of crazy. Um, and so before November 2014, the way we dealt with these problems tended to be less stylus and SAS. Like we use CSS for processors to make our lives better. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that since 2014, while well, we've been thinking, well, you know, it really is this, is this the best way, um, and coming up with some other ideas. So Wikipedia has this to say about CSS. Uh, cascading style sheets is a style sheet language for describing the presentation of a document in a markup language. Um, I'll highlight that it's a document. So I think CSS makes sense, actually, for, from the perspective of what it's trying to do. You have a document, and then you're separating out the styles. Um, it's good practice because it makes it easy to change the way you're presenting that document without having to change the document itself. So I don't know about you, um, but I know a lot of JavaScript developers are working on things that look more like this. This is our login form. Um, that doesn't look like a document to me. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe we should just put our JavaScript, our uh, styles in JavaScript, right? Um, because we're not really working on documents. Um, and the, the kind of argument that comes against that is that people, people will say, separations of concerns. You, know, must, you must separate these things. And if it's good for documents, surely it must be good for uh, user interfaces also, right? <laughs> All right. Uh, anyway, I will just speak over the platform, yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, when React first came out, so talking about separation of concerns here, when React first came out, um, many people, myself included, had a hard time with this thing, uh, JSX, where you're sort of mixing what looks like HTML in with your JavaScript, uh, and it just felt kind of wrong. It felt like we're losing some kind of separation that we had uh, when we were using template languages. Um, and some people still feel this way about JSX. Um, but most of us have found out that, have just sort of decided over time that separating the markup uh, from the rest of the component code really wasn't doing us anything in particular, any particular good. Um, and I think most people using React today just use JSX, and it's not really a problem. So again, this, this sort of separation uh, is valuable, right? Because we've got the, 
the visual presentation of the document separated out. Um, another way to think about that is that we're separating the visual representation from the data, right? Um, and another name for that is model and view. Like we've been doing this stuff for a long time. We've been separating out model and view. Um, and so this separation is valuable. Like you still want your separation of this is the data and the way I manage my data, and this is the presentation part of that. So on the web, when you're dealing with the presentation of information, you have to build up a DOM and you have to have styles, otherwise you don't have a presentation, right? I mean, you have to have both those things in order to have a complete component in, 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 React, in the React sense, right? Um, so uh, basically, using React and Aphrodite, you can put both the, the component and the DOM that you're building up uh, along with the styles, and so that component can be a, in one file, a nice representation of that view for that component. Yes? Oh, this, this one is just, we'll, the, the font will be bigger on, on ones where the code actually matters. <laughs> this is more just for the idea that if we're putting it all in one file, it makes our lives better. Um, and I'll, I'll, in story form, like this is actually something that um, I worked on a few, few months ago. Um, early this year, we had a math challenge called LearnStorm. And uh, for LearnStorm, we created leaderboards. And so we had, um, we had a site with the leaderboards on it. And we also, a feature that I was working on was that we wanted to be able to have on individual students' profile pages. So if you go to Khan Academy, uh, each person can have a profile page. It shows you know, kind of how many energy points they've earned and things like that. If they were participating in LearnStorm, and if they were on the leaderboard that week, we wanted to show their leaderboard entry on that profile page. Um, and what was great is that since we were using Aphrodite for this, uh, I just brought in the leaderboard entry component that some other developer wrote and just dropped it right there in the profile page, and it looked perfect. It, was, it looked exactly like that. Uh, and I didn't have to change what, uh, what CSS files were being included on that page or uh, anything like that. All I had to do was just bring the component in, and it was complete and ready to run. So that's the idea, is that our concerns are actually still separated. We still do not put our data management and stuff into our components. Our components are still stateless and all of that. Um, but even better, everything required for the component lives in one file, in one place. So it's easy, um, if something goes wrong, it's easy to know where to look. So with that bit of background, um, talk about Aphrodite and how you actually use it and what it's like. <laughs> so the, the, why, um, <laughs> the why is the harder part. It, it's really, uh, Aphrodite makes this straightforward. So it, it gives you this blend of feeling like, this feels like inline styling uh, that you're doing in JavaScript. How many people have done that with React, where you just do inline styles the React way? Okay, yeah, still not very many. Um, so, so yeah, it's just like using the features of a style sheet, but at the same time, you've got the full power of an imperative programming language um, and some other features that Aphrodite sprinkles in there. Um, and I'll note that it's not just React. So I'm gonna be talking about examples in React, because it's what we use, um, but there's actually no tie to React for this. Uh, it's, it's completely independent. Um, and actually, Brian made a connector to Angular, um, which some people may get to play, play around with if you use Angular. Um, and, and actually, uh, one of the other things that people can play with also is with vanilla JavaScript. Like it, you can, it just manages your styles. It doesn't care what, what manages your view otherwise. So um, Aphrodite has a tiny API that you use you know, almost all the time which is basically you just import style sheet and CSS. Uh, those, those two names are all you need to import. Um, and you know, there's the, the expression, the devils in the details. I'll, I'll just say for Aphrodite, there are a few little details, but there aren't really many devils because it's really, we'll see, it's, it's very straightforward. Um, so the first thing you do is you create a style sheet, a uh, style sheet object, and in this case, we're creating a style sheet with um, a class of red, and it's got a background color of red, and that's you know, all it's defining. Very simple, um, and generally uh, we put these at the end of a JSX file. Um, it's just the way we typically do it. So then, um, in in your React code, in your render, uh, you're basically going to set and to stress this is not inline styles. We're actually setting class names. So we are setting a class name of uh, calling that CSS function. So we use the style sheet dot create, and then we're using the CSS function to actually give us the class name for that particular class, styles.red. Um, and that's it. So when we've done that, 
um, it's going to set the styles for that uh, for that particular node. So because this is using the stress is not inline styles, it's actually creating style sheets. Um, that means that we can use pseudo classes like hover, and we don't have to write JavaScript to do that. Um, and you'll find that a lot of the other uh, CSS and JavaScript solutions do use actual inline styles, and therefore hover has to be done with JavaScript. Uh, and stuff stuff like visited, you can't do at all. So um, so this is nice, and again, this like reduces some of the surprise of using this tool. Um, and using that st that hover style, like we have that as a separate style, it's very easy. You can just say style, see it called the CSS function with both styles.red and styles.hover, and it will merge the two together uh, and give you a new class name for that. So it's, um, yeah, very straightforward uh, to use. So what's the semantics of this? Is this only red when you're hovering? Well, so this works just like, just as if you had put, applied those two classes n through normal CSS. Like if you had made, if you had made a, a CSS class, one that's red and then another one that's hover, mm -hmm. and you applied both those class names to this, uh, to this node, it, it works exactly like that. Um, it's, it's actually no different at all. <laughs> um, yeah. In the actual HTML that's generated, <coughs> what is the class name assigned to the span? Like a symbol generated thing? Um, good segue, because that's what's next. <laughs> so just, just so there's no confusion, let's let's actually look at what, what Aphrodite is doing, um, because it's pretty straightforward again. So uh, this is in the console here. Um, I went ahead and created a style sheet object, um, and it's the same one that we were just looking at. And you can see the object that's returned um, has a red property on it, and in there, um, We've got that original definition is there as underscore definition. And then there's also an underscore name. And underscore name is red. It's called red underscore and then a hash, which doesn't really matter. But, um, but basically, that, that name is the class name that Aphrodite generated for it. Um, and a useful thing to know about that is that that hash is actually uh, a stable hash for that particular definition, which means that um, I'll talk about server-side rendering in a minute, but basically uh, that enables server-side rendering. So then when we call the CSS function, all it's doing is returning that underscore name, um, and so that is the actual class name that's going to get applied to the node, that red underscore and then a hash. And then once you call the CSS function, the other thing uh, Aphrodite does is it's going to create the uh, style tag in the head um, with a data Aphrodite um, attribute. And then you can see exactly you know, the class name that was just defined and the, uh, the actual definition of that style. So I mean, it does, it's pretty much doing exactly what you would expect it to do. <laughs> There's really, again, no surprise um, to it. OK, so talking about the server-side rendering case, um, this is actually a more or less complete example, you know, mostly complete example of server-side rendering. Um, so it's not going to be very different. Uh, it's just going to be a little, just a couple of tricks to basically make it work server-side. Um, I should note, the reason that you do this server-side, in case people haven't sort of gone down the path of React server-side rendering, um, is that, you know, if you, well, actually before HTTP2 comes along, um, if you can put your CSS into the HTML that is delivered to the client, especially on mobile, you save a round trip to the server. And that makes a big difference on mobile. Like the, the, the speed of delivery is so much faster. Um, and so the idea here is that um, we're going to bundle the CSS in with that actual HTML file that the user is getting, um, so that the initial, H, uh, the, the initial CSS, so that um, so they get optimal performance, basically. Uh, so, you, so you import style sheet server from Aphrodite when you're on the server side. And then you call the render static function on there. Um, and then Again, this doesn't this isn't tied to React, so you just have you just pass in some function that's going to return the HTML, um, sort of the body or whatever. I, I guess it's, yeah, it can be whatever form of HTML you want because you're going to merge this stuff together yourself. Um, and so that the render static is going to return both HTML and CSS. And then um, you add the style tag in in whatever your output is. So you're going to create the style tag for Aphrodite to hook onto when it gets going on the client side. Uh, and you pass in the content 
CSS.content there. Um, so that's going to be your initial style sheet. And then you call stylesheet.rehydrate, and you pass in um, a JSON stringified version of the rendered class names from the CSS object. So, the, so basically, this is the sort of the key. Remember what I was saying about that hash um, and how style, uh, the class names have consistent names. Uh, and the reason that's important is because the server is going to render out that initial page. And when it does so, it's going to collect up all the CSS that was rendered as part of that. And when it does that, um, it's going to keep track of which class names it generated, and it's going to then pass that along to the client for when you rehydrate. And that means that when Aphrodite comes along and starts running on the client, it's not going to try to regenerate those same styles. It knows, oh, they're already there. Like if you use that red class again, it's going to say, oh, I've already, that, that one is one of the ones that was rendered on the server. I don't need to generate it again. Yeah? Uh, does the red class have the same hash throughout the document? Yes. Basically, it's, the, it's based on that definition. So whatever the, whatever, so it was background color red was the, def, the, like the full definition of that style. And so that is what the hash is based on. And so um, wherever you, as long as that style is called red, that you'll have that same class name throughout the cycle. So maybe you said this, but I maybe I'll just state it with confirmation. So can, can, can I state that assuming that once the client takes over and starts doing this, that it's using this hash essentially the same way that React uses P to decide where to insert things as well? Because it has to figure out, for example, once the client picks up whether that whether that style almost all is there if, if you have some dynamic content. Because the dynamic content may trigger a call to CSS on the client, then it has yep. to say, it has to know, you know, sort of that it's there and then maybe it needs to pull it out or put it in. But it inserts and it removes stuff from the DOM based on that as well. So Aphrodite, um, as far as I know, doesn't ever actually remove anything from the style sheet. Uh, um, but it does, but it, but it only generates the ones that it needs to generate. And it does indeed use that list to make sure it doesn't generate it again, because it, it, it knows, OK, I've already got it up there. Yep. Uh, can you pass the last name and hash to the JavaScript so that you can read it later? Um, I mean, I guess, I guess by calling the CSS function, you have, you have the access to that name. Um, that's, not, that's not really, like if you're working with React, that, like my, my spidey sense is going off. It's like, this is not a React-y way of doing things. <laughs> but, but if you're doing it in vanilla, vanilla JavaScript or something, I can imagine, I, I don't know, I would think you'd probably still want, you, you probably want to just leave that as like an opaque value. Uh, and just like if you if you need to get a hold of that node later on, apply your own your own class name in addition. Um, that way, after that, you can sort of do whatever it needs to do there, and you know, just consider it an implementation value uh, con uh, implementation constraint. One more question. Yeah. Am I also this closure that you have within this arrow function? Am I correct in understanding that what's going to happen there is that it, it needs to run that so that sort of look. There's, there's some sort of side effect here going on with the CSS function, so it has to do the render and then see what, what styles were essentially injected because of that render. Yep. And so it wants to bracket it to know before and after, essentially. That's right. Yeah, right. Yep. Well, it's not so much a Reactism, it's that um, Aphrodite only generates styles when the CSS function is called, which typically you're only generating when you've actually sort of rendered out your UI. So it has to wait for it. So the CSS function has to get called sometime, and it's whenever you're when you're actually doing that first render. So that pretty much is whatever whatever framework you're running on the server. It doesn't have to be React. You have to do the same thing. I was always asking about that. What is it? No, no, I was just wondering what the closure was about. I mean, you can pass a component in, for example. I'm just trying to figure out. You know, I guess you're trying to give some flexibility there and what people are doing in terms of the, how the rendering is done. Right, exactly. I mean, that, that could be asynchronous there, so um, I think that's why it's like that. So um, just as with pseudo classes, uh, as you'd probably expect, you can do media queries because, again, it's just normal CSS, so media queries will work um, pretty much exactly like you'd expect. One of the things, that, since we are generating this style sheet, we might as well do a little bit of useful stuff for you. So in the case of Flexbox, um, if you look at the the example up top, uh, you know, it's basically creating something that says display colon flex. And if you look at the generated code down below, um, it's generated basically the, the uh, prefix, the prefixes for all the browsers, um, the older browsers that might still be using prefixes. 
So, um, so that's nice. I mean, that, since we're generating a style sheet, might as well do that for you automatically. Now, those of you um, who have better vision than I do might have noticed that <laughs> uh, important appears on everything that is generating. Um, now, the reason for that is that you might have existing code, and we want this to feel like inline styles. We want it to be easy to sort of integrate uh, with an existing code base and have the stuff you're applying at this level um, a, a take precedence. Um, now, if you know for a fact that specificity is not a problem for you, um, then you can actually import uh, style sheet and CSS from Aphrodite slash no important. And if you do that, then it's not going to add all those bang important in there. Because uh, you know it's not necessary. So one more thing that Aphrodite does for you that's pretty nice is that when you're using a custom font, you need to include an at font face declaration in your CSS. Um, and you want to do that only once. And so what you can do with Aphrodite is you basically make a, um, a, a, uh, thing, a an object, <laughs> uh, in this case called cool font, but this object is, uh, is basically defining the font itself, so it gives it the source URL and all of that. And then, then basically whenever you're declaring a font family, you're, you can just use that cool font. And font family can be an array, so you can drop cool font in there. Um, and as, once you've done that the first time, Aphrodite will then create the at font face for you automatically. Um, and again, just that one time. So, um, you know, since this is JavaScript, namespacing is free you, with whatever module system you're using. Um, you can share styles via normal module imports. And of course, we have variables because it's a real programming language. Um, minification is something we already do to our JavaScript, so that, that's covered. So pretty much, you know, Aphrodite is really fixing the problems that Christopher Chedeau brought up in this talk, um, you know, which basically Facebook themselves in that talk, they were talking about using inline styles. Uh, so in this case, Aphrodite can fix those same problems, but without introducing new problems of its own, or not many, um, because it's, uh, it be, because it's um, actual generating, generating style sheets, not inline styles. So again, because it's simple JS, um, this is an example from our code base um, of a component that is very configurable in terms of how it appears. Um, it's, a, it's a modal, um, and so it's very configurable. And basically, all those configuration options are just passed in as props on the component. And it's each of those styles is basically conditionally applied based on what props you pass in. And anything that's falsy, Aphrodite will just ignore. So you can you can just do something really simple. Uh, and concise like this to do a whole bunch of conditional styling. So one of the one of the very few gotchas here um, is that in CSS, when you see content, content has to be quoted, um, and so you need to in your JavaScript sort of double quote it. You need to put quotes and then put quotes inside the quotes uh, in order to make it so that when the CSS is generated, um, it will actually end up coming out as content colon quote and then your, your content. So um, that's one one little thing you need to be aware of. Um, and during the <coughs> workshop thing, which I think we'll have some time for, yeah, um, we you may find yourself needing to do this. So I just thought I'd call it out. Um, there, are, there are other things in the readme, but there's actually very little uh, else to know about this. Um, so I will say a few things about transitioning to Aphrodite. Like if you haven't done this, this kind of um, thing before. So I'd say it's an iterative process, just like transitioning to React. Like a lot of people who have an existing code base will just, you know, take one little part of their UI and move it over to React. Um, same sort of thing here. You just take one little part of your UI, you know, go component by component, um, or just new components. Uh, mm -hmm. We've got a lot of code at Khan Academy, um, and so far our approach has been pretty much when we create a new component, we use Aphrodite, um, but we haven't done a whole lot of sort of retroactively Aphrodite and applying stuff until we have a real need other than just Aphrodite. So yeah, that is really about all you need to know about Aphrodite. <laughs> yeah. Any times when I'm working on projects, so when you're doing coding, maybe I'll do some CSS and do custom. Do you fix this problem? That's a good question. So the question was, um, if you are working with designers who are the ones who typically do your CSS, uh, how do you deal with that here? Um, so 
our designers, for the most part, are giving us designs and not CSS, <laughs> uh, and we're making we're making components that match those designs. Uh, if this if the designers were creating the CSS for us, I mean, we could still conceivably use this if they hand us um, CSS that they're working via mockups, and we're using React or creating components. We can still take the um, take that CSS that they gave us and just convert it uh, to work in here. Um, you know, I think that's. You know that is a workflow question. I mean, if you want the if you want the designers to sort of own it, I guess that's another thing too. Is that conceivably designers like if they if they already know how to do CSS, they could probably do this too. Um, there sort of is. I will actually mention that <laughs> there there is indeed something similar, to, something like that. Yeah. Go to you know like Bootstrap home page, right? They, they have SAS or less or whatever it is they're using now. Uh, files. And, and the thing that I'm trying to understand here is in this case, if you have a uniform style that you want to apply, how, how do you I mean if I wanted to make a site and somehow leverage all the design that that relates to Bootstrap, but using Aphrodite, how is it, uh, is it possible for Bootstrap people to somehow create a bunch of modules that I can then just reference as my as these styles or not possible at all. Um, so it would be possible for them to do that. Uh, I mean, I think you know one of the one of the challenges there is that you can do things with Aphrodite that you can't do with um, with Bootstrap. And the, I mean, I think the other aspect too is that you can uh, is that you know if you're building Angular or build, building React components or whatever. Um, you know, you can fit Aphrodite, something like Aphrodite, into your workflow better. I think. Uh, I, I think it's just sort of. I think it's solving in some ways a different problem. Um, I mean, so I will say that there, there's nothing in Aphrodite that prevents you from continuing to use CSS. Like you can use that as sort of a baseline, and then you can add additional styles on top of that using Aphrodite, um, because it's all just CSS in the end. Um, so there's nothing that prevents you from using it that way, but. Um, it would be a big job for the bootstrap people <laughs> to, to try to support something like well, that. Material design, right? I mean, you know, all the design requirements you know, somehow can do something like that. So I could imagine, like, somebody has created a, a, a library, you looked at that this morning, right? That, that, was doing, that was doing CSS grids, that kind of thing, uh, as in React components with Aphrodite. Um, there, I mean, you can, there's certainly nothing that stops people from making libraries. That that you know they're JavaScript libraries, but they're serving the same purpose as Bootstrap. That can certainly that would certainly make sense. So uh, sorry, I was because I was I'll come from that perspective as well. So I looked at stuff and uh, there's a there's a the equivalent of yeah. Bootstrap or Foundation uh, kind of here uh, is what I found. Uh, but also I found that actually there's an easier way to do that if you just want to say normalize. Create a JavaScript module so that their individual CSS elements that they wanted to see inherent to their kind of just simply variables, uh, but also maybe some other classes. And I don't know if there's other better approaches, but I think that's what most of them. It seems like you kind of have to start completely from scratch in terms of style with this. I mean, if you, if you say you can't really start with a baseline, so you kind of have the style of people tell their own ideas. I think there's some orthogonal concerns when it comes to this type of thing, but if you're doing something like Bootstrap, Bootstrap's already kind of come up with style approach. So you can, they're not mutually exclusive concepts. And so a lot of times you may apply a couple class names for Bootstrap, and then a couple class names you can mix um, to augment the system. So, be, so you can still use the class names that Bootstrap gives you, Kind of lose that componentization ability, like you do. If, but if you're dropping it in the same page that has Bootstrap, it still works because your component will still say, "I use, you know, um, I use the button class, for example. You just button class, and then any extra styling you would want to add, um, kind of like you would do if you weren't using Aphrodite. You do the same thing. You use button class, and then you use your class. So Aphrodite would be kind of for your class. But I guess our, our code base is also a pretty good example of this because we have a lot we have a lot of less files, um, and we've been basically as we've been creating new things, 
Um, we've been building up a library of shared styles, shared you know variables with, the, with our common colors and things like that in them. Um, and you know, eventually, as more and more of our site moves over, um, the less files will get smaller and smaller and eventually go away. So, um, you know, that's, I guess, just part of the iterative transition from, from one paradigm to the other. Yeah. There's a, a working draft standard, I think it's called Scope CSS or CSS Scope. Right. Basically, it allows you, nobody's supporting it yet, I don't think. Chrome might support that. Pardon? Chrome might support that because it's part of the web components no, I don't stuff. I think it scope styles. I think it's well. Let me just ask the question. You put a style element, and then it applies to everything under the the, the style parent. Right. So it's not global anymore. Right. If that becomes adopted by the browsers, what impact would that have? Um, so how would scope styles affect Aphrodite? I mean, conceivably, uh, I mean, it, it seems plausible that you might want to use scope styles with React components and that you could use Aphrodite to generate the styles that go in there, but um, I don't really know enough about that spec yet. And I'm not sure how far along the support is yet for it. So, um, you know, I, I would imagine that as things as things move forward, we will find other ways that we want to approach these things. Like part of the reason why, like the server side rendering, uh, part of the reason that the server side rendering with the uh, with it all glommed together in one HTML file is re is relevant is because we don't have HTTP two everywhere yet. Um, so you know, so as the standards mutate, like we get new capabilities, and then some of our old capabilities, some of the old old hacks that we had to work around the capabilities we had. Yeah, I'm just wondering if it, if it was implemented say, in a year's time, and you hopped on the Aphrodite train today, do you just jump on back to scope styles? Well, no, I don't think I don't think you jump back to scope styles because I think there's still value in having your your styles relative to that component live with the component in that one file. I still think that's actually valuable. Um, and so, even if you're even if you're generating scope styles, even if you're changing some one of the mechanisms you're using, I think it's still beneficial that your styles um, are right there with your component. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. So right, right now we've got a little bit of time, which is good, um, so we can play around with this. Uh, and so I'll, I'll just mention that the README and the Aphrodite repository has a couple more details, but they're not really critical for the most common uses. Um, so we can get to using it. Um, so I don't know how many, lots of people have probably seen Todo MVC. It's become really popular at this point. Um, it's actually, it's one of the nice things about Todo MVC is that it's available with all kinds of JavaScript libraries um, and it uses pretty much the same style sheets for all of them. And so what I was thinking was we can go ahead and Take the CSS in here uh, and convert bits and pieces over to Aphrodite and just see how see how it works, see how it feels. Um, and so to make that easy, I set up three different flavors of Todo MVC with Aphrodite pre-installed and ready to go. So when you look at the index file, Aphrodite is there as a global on the page, so you can just you know have at it right away. Um, so there's React, Angular, and Vanilla flavors at those URLs. Um, and then there's also this tool um, that will convert, uh, it's called CSS to React, but it's basically just generally CSS to JavaScript. Um, so you can basically copy and paste a block of CSS in there and it'll give you JavaScript out um, that you can then copy and paste directly into your code. Save you some manual rejiggering of, of things. Um, yeah, and that's, that's pretty much all you need. And I will leave that slide up so we can actually play around with it. Uh, happy to take any more questions anybody might have. Um, as as like a heavy React user, n not that I've seen. <laughs> like this is this really is just all better than working with less. Um, I mean, it, it's yeah. I <laughs> wouldn't want to go back. Is there a URL in Khan Academy you could look at the source and see what's my action? Um, well, if you just go to ConAcademy.org, I mean, I think it's in use on every page. It is. Yeah. I believe so. Yeah. I, okay. Really? Yeah.
Yeah, yeah, because because we have we're actually so like our nav bar is server side rendered React. Um, so yeah, we we are using Afro Daddy all over the place. So just out of curiosity, have you worked on this for a few months and it's all across your site now? Well, it's not used everywhere. Like I mean, so it's it it, it exists on literally every page, but there are parts of the page that still have, that are still using our old less styles. So depending on you know which which page you happen to hit, which module, but it's on like the headers. So it's but it's on the header, so it's on every page. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like most code bases, there's still backbone code. And yeah. <laughs> and there's React code, and there's React with um, three dots, and there's React with older style flux. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Depending on the component, but there, each one is its own its own little thing. Backwards and stuff. It's not in all. Yep. Any other questions? When you're running it, do you run it with the uh, important languages? Uh, probably. Given given that we still have those less yeah. files around, we probably do. Make yeah, sure. I haven't checked, but I'm guessing we do. All right. Cool. <laughs> Makes sense. It didn't do. It didn't trample. I was just like, oh, why is this important? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I'm around. If you have any questions, if you want to play with this, you know, singly or in pairs, um, have at it. <laughs>